start off uh, just by saying we are experiencing just some minor technical difficulties. Um, so as we try to work through those, bear with us. But I'm going to go ahead and get started with tonight's program. My name is Pat Kane, uh, Public Programs Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie. But I'm going to turn it over uh, to Barb to kick off our program tonight. Well, welcome to the 14th, I can't believe it, 14 years, 14th annual uh, Lincoln Lecture Series at the Museum of the Grand Prairie. This will be our third and final um, lecture this year. Um, and we're really glad that you were able to come um, and join us um, virtually. And we're hoping to do this hybrid next year so that you can always um, join us virtually. Um, but before we get into um, introducing our speaker today, uh, I'd like to invite you all to another, if you are in Champaign-Urbana area or Champaign County, I'd like to invite you to a, um, an event on the 10th of December, that's a Friday in the afternoon from 1.30 to 3.00. Um, we will be celebrating the 191st birthday of Judge Oscar Cunningham. Now, why am I telling you about this at the Lincoln Lecture Series? Because Judge Oscar, uh, Joseph Oscar Cunningham was the um, reputedly the last lawyer alive to have practiced with Lincoln. He was a judge in Champaign County, and he and his wife, gave their mansion to become um, a home for orphans in the, to the Methodist Missionary Society. And it is the, the um, was the genesis of the uh, Cunningham Children's Home. He also uh, was on the first University of Illinois Board of Trustees and was just a stall and were the, the best history up to that point of the Champaign County in 1905. So um, one of Lincoln's friends in Champaign County, and we're going to honor him at the courthouse on uh, on, the, on the 10th of December from 1.30 to 3, our speak, speech, featured speaker, sorry, that wasn't that hard to say, is Steve Beckett, and there'll be a small exhibit um, about Cunningham at the courthouse at that time. Of course, because it's in the courthouse, you will have to come in without a cell phone and following courthouse protocols. All right, Pat, I can turn it over to you now if that's, uh, if that's helpful. All right, thank you, Barb. Um, still trying to work through these technical difficulties. Um, uh, but uh, thank you, Barb, for that. And uh, be sure to check out uh, that exhibit at the Champaign County Courthouse if you are local. Um, and yeah, before we get into tonight's program, <clears throat> uh, I did want to go over uh, a few other things, uh, some general housekeeping as well as uh, questions, should you have them and promote some upcoming programs. Um, uh, so first, um, uh, uh, I did want to let you know, actually, uh, we would love for you to let us know where you're watching from, which many of you, um, have already shared down in the comments below, uh, Lainey tuning in from Toledo, uh, Patrick tuning in from all the way in Minnesota, uh, Kristen, uh, tuning in again. Thank you so much for tuning in, Kristen. Good to see you. Brian tuning in all the way from New York and Katie right here in central Illinois tuning in from Urbana. So if you haven't had the, if you haven't already, please let us know where you're watching from down below. Uh, always love to see where folks are tuning in from. We've got quite a reach all over the United States tonight. So um, uh, thank you for tuning in. Maybe you're watching from somewhere else around the world even. Uh, so thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Um, a little bit about the uh, uh, Museum of the Grand Prairie, if you're unfamiliar with us. Uh, we're located in Muhammad, Illinois in Champaign County. Uh, we're about 15 to 20 minutes for, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign campus. Um, our museum opened originally in 1968 as the Early American Museum, and our current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural natural history of Champaign County and East Central Illinois for all generations. We are part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District, which is a collection of seven forest preserves 
um, here in Champaign County, as well as two educational facilities, including our, our museum at Museum of the Grand Prairie, as well as the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, fo focusing more on environmental education and natural history at Homer Lake Forest Reserve in Homer, Illinois. Also includes a golf course, Kickapoo Rail Trail, and so much more. So check out Champaign County Forest Reserve District um, if you are local here in East Central Illinois. Also, um, we would love to hear from you. Um, uh, looking to get some feedback on our program. So what I'm doing right now is dropping a, a survey for tonight's program, a general program survey. If you would be so kind, we would love to get some feedback on tonight's program. Let us know what you thought about it. Also, let us know what programs uh, you would like for us to do um, in the future. Any particular topics you may be interested in seeing a public program um, uh, on, feel free to mention that in this general program survey. A um, few other things coming up and some things that have happened in the recent past. Uh, as Barb mentioned, this is our third and final program in this year's 14th annual Lincoln Lecture Series. Uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to check out our previous programs, I strongly recommend that you do so by checking out the recordings on our Facebook and YouTube pages um, from earlier on this fall. Our first program was a book discussion with historian and author Richard Streiner as he went over major themes and arguments from his newest work, Summoned to Glory, The Audacious Life of Abraham Lincoln. And we had another program that was a discussion with filmmakers and contributors to a, a new film, a uh, new documentary film titled Lincoln and Douglas, Touring Illinois in Turbulent Times, looking at the commemoration of the Lincoln-Douglas debates in the state of Illinois uh, as uh, uh, Graham Peck, Nathan Peck, and film contributor Sunshine Clemens. Um, uh, uh, it, it took place during the summer of 2020, during some pretty turbulent times, as I'm sure we're all well aware of. Uh, so check out those two previous programs um, on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Those recordings can be found there. Um, on Thursday, December 9th, um, we're going to be doing another online event streaming again on the Museum of the Grand Prairie Facebook and YouTube pages um, at 7 o'clock, where our garden program specialist at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, Marina Montez Ellis, is going to present the program from, from Pleistocene to present, A Brief History of the Mayberry Gelvin Botanical Gardens. It's going to be an excellent program for a great piece of uh, Champaign County uh, Forest Preserve District and Champaign County history, Mayberry Gelvin Botanical Gardens. Uh, Maria is going to go uh, way back and look at the natural and cultural history of this, this area, as well as the history of the Buffalo Trace Prairie area, uh, not too far from us in um, uh, Muhammad here, close to the Museum of the Grand Prairie, right across the street from us. So check out this virtual presentation again on Thursday, December 9th on our uh, Facebook and YouTube pages. Uh, then on Thursday, January uh, 20th, another virtual presentation we're putting on, we're kicking off our, our annual garden speaker series where the theme for this year uh, will deal with medicinal plants, how humans have used them throughout history and how to start a medicinal plant garden of your very own. Um, uh, and our first program is gonna be titled Medicinal Plants and Their Use, where Professor Emerita of Pathology at the Indiana University School of Medicine, Kathleen Hull, MD, will join us as she discusses her involvement as head of the Indiana Medical History Museum's medical, uh, I'm sorry, medicinal garden project. Um, and then also we'll share how, uh, particular plants that can be found in that garden, uh, how they've been used throughout history and how some have even led to some modern med medicines that still exist today. So check out that particular program on Thursday, January 20th at seven o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, the program will be medicinal plants and their use. Uh, for more info about these programs, everything else happening at Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, and visit museumofthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org. Um, again, let us know where you're watching from by writing down below in the comment section. Nancy tuning in um, from Champaign. Welcome back, Nancy and Kristen tuning in from Evanston. Uh, also, should you have any questions um, uh, tonight, feel free to write those down in the comment section as well. We'll address questions at the end of the program. So with that, I am pleased to bring on our presenter tonight, and let's see if we've got these technical difficulties worked out. Matthew, can you see me? Can you hear me? I can. Can you see and hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we can. Okay. All right. So just in time. Really, uh, really appreciate it, Matthew. Thanks for your patience and your flexibility with tonight's program and for presenting this program, I'm excited to learn to learn more here in just a few moments. So um, uh, I, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce Matthew, and then I will turn the show over to you. So this is Dr. Uh, Matthew Norman. 
Uh, Matthew received his undergraduate degree from Knox College uh, and a PhD in history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, currently, Matthew is Associate Professor of History at University of Cincinnati Blue Ash College, uh, where, he, where he has taught since 2011. Uh, prior to his arrival um, at UC, uh, he taught at Gettysburg College and worked at the Lincoln Studies Center at Knox College, where he led a team that helped make the Abraham Lincoln Papers at the Library of Congress available online. Matthew's research focuses on Abraham Lincoln, race, memory, the Civil War, and long reconstruction. He is the co-author of Knowing Him by Heart, African Americans on Abraham Lincoln, that will be published by the University of Illinois Press, the University of Illinois Press next year. Lastly, he is currently working on a project that explores the impact of the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in the 1883 civil rights cases. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew. And again, thank you so much for presenting tonight's program. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope we have all the technical kinks worked out. So I'm going to tempt fate and share my screen. Alrighty. And hopefully you'll see a PowerPoint presentation. Here we are. Okay. So thank you for that introduction, Patrick. And as Patrick said, the, the title of my talk is Knowing Him by Heart, African Americans on Abraham Lincoln. And what I'm going to talk about tonight is some of the research that I've done for this forthcoming book that collects African American views on Abraham Lincoln from 1858 to 2009. In April 1863, John Proctor, a former slave and recent enlistee in the second South Carolina Volunteers, wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln in which he stated how much he was looking forward to the opportunity of capturing his former master and wished that he could have, in his words, the pleasure of coming to behold you with mine eyes. Proctor closed the letter by requesting that Lincoln remember him to his fellow citizens of the United States. For Proctor, the Emancipation Proclamation and Lincoln's decision to allow black men to serve in the army were nothing short of revolutionary. He had gone from being enslaved to a soldier and a citizen. And his gratitude towards Lincoln is palpable as one reads the sincere words of a newly freed man who only wished to gaze upon the author of the Emancipation Proclamation with his own eyes. A little over 100 years later, after Proctor wrote to Lincoln, Lerone Bennett Jr., an African-American journalist and historian, offered a very different assessment of Lincoln when he wrote in an Ebony Magazine article that Lincoln was, quote, the very essence of the white supremacist with good intentions. Bennett dismissed the image of Lincoln as the great emancipator as nothing more than a pernicious myth. Lincoln did not care for black people and the Emancipation Proclamation was the act of a very reluctant liberator who had engaged in a desperate and pathetic effort to preserve slavery during the first 18 months of the Civil War. The true heroes in Bennett's view were the abolitionists who pressured Lincoln and finally forced him to take action against slavery. Bennett's Lincoln never reconciled himself to the implications of emancipation, and he went to his grave still searching for a way to rid the country of an unwanted population of African Americans. Instead of Lincoln transcending his environment, Bennett believed he must be seen as the embodiment of the American tradition of racism. So how does one account for such diverse views of Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation? In his seminal work, Lincoln and the Negro, published nearly 60 years ago during the centennial year of Lincoln's preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, Benjamin Quarles, an African-American historian, reminded readers of a statement that Frederick Douglass had made regarding the primacy of Lincoln's place in the consciousness of African-Americans. We all know Lincoln by heart. Douglas certainly knew Lincoln by heart, yet he either experienced several changes of heart or perhaps he possessed a divided heart. In the immediate wake of Lincoln's assassination, Douglas wrote that Lincoln was emphatically the black man's president. But 11 years later, 
at the dedication of Thomas Ball's Emancipation Group in Washington, D.C., Douglas characterized Lincoln as preeminently the white man's president, and Black people were therefore only Lincoln's stepchildren. Yet Douglas also described Lincoln as our friend and liberator who was near and dear to our hearts. Ball's sculpture, which you see pictured here on the slide, epitomizes the image of emancipation as a gift that Lincoln gave to the enslaved and figuratively depicts what has been referred to as the emancipation moment. Certainly Lincoln's signing of the final Emancipation Proclamation on New Year's Day, 1863, marked the seminal emancipation moment for the United States. African-American views of Lincoln help illuminate a contradictory tendency that has historian David Bryan Davis observed, hails emancipation as a glorious moment of national rebirth that proved in many ways a failure. Just months after Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, James Hudson criti criticized it as a halfway measure that applied only to areas beyond the reach of federal authority and continued to allow slavery in states or portions of states that remained loyal to the Union. Frustrated by the lack of progress toward full equality, Frederick Douglass declared in 1888 that the so-called emancipation was a stupendous fraud and practically a lie. Even though Ball's monument suggests that the issue of emancipation has been settled and freedom was a gift Lincoln bestowed upon the enslaved, the idealized slave kneeling at Lincoln's feet is at odds with the nearly 200,000 black men who took up arms to secure their freedom and the black voices that criticized Lincoln during his presidency and exhorted him to take action against slavery and on behalf of racial equality. Over a year after Lincoln issued the final Emancipation Proclamation, a black soldier serving in the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry expressed his frustration with the president when he wrote, quote, Mr. Lincoln's policy in regard to the elevation and inseparability of the Negro race has always been one of a fickle-minded man, one who holding anti-slavery principles in one hand and, and colonization in the other, always gave concessions to slavery when the union could be preserved without touching the peculiar institution. Such a man is not again worthy the votes of the voting portion of the colored race. On the other hand, Osborne Anderson, the sole surviving black participant in John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, asserted that Lincoln's proclamation was the greatest event in the history of our country and had vindicated the principles for which John Brown had given his life. Amos Beeman, a Congregationalist minister, personified these divisions when in 1864, he celebrated the Emancipation Proclamation and praised Lincoln. But he also noted that the president was far from being a perfect man in the science of human freedom. For Beeman saw no proof that Lincoln accepted the solemn and sublime idea of the perfect equality and equal brotherhood of the whole human race. Beeman's divided heart on Lincoln mirrors a larger trend in African-American memory. As Quarrel suggests in Lincoln and the Negro, quote, Lincoln became Lincoln because of the Negro. African-American commemoration of Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation played a vital role in shaping the Lincoln image. Much had happened in the century between John Proctor's letter to Lincoln and the publication of Bennett's article in Ebony. But it would be a gross oversimplification to assume that African-American views on Lincoln have followed a straight line trajectory that went from uncritical adulation in the 1860s to bitter disillusionment by the 1960s. The words of Proctor, Douglas, Beeman, Bennett, and others reveal a complex diversity of thoughts and feelings about Lincoln and the meaning of emancipation. Ever since Lincoln came to the forefront on the national political stage, African-Americans have expressed a variety of opinions about him and his perceived commitment to freedom and racial equality. In the century that followed the Emancipation Proclamation, 
African-Americans grappled with Lincoln's legacy. And the memory of the Emancipation Proclamation figured prominently in creating a usable past to advance the cause of racial equality. Clearly, African-Americans knew Lincoln by heart, but Lincoln's place in black memory reflected a variety of hopes, fears, aspirations, and frustrations that frequently cause these hearts to be divided. As a consequence of the Emancipation Proclamation, enlistment of black soldiers, and the suggestion that at least some black men should vote, Lincoln's assassination prompted an outpouring of grief from the African-American community. In his eulogy of Lincoln, George Levere, the chaplain of the 20th U.S. Colored Infantry, praised him as a truly great man committed to justice and right. Levere urged his audience to record the name of Abraham Lincoln in their Bibles and pass them down to succeeding generations. In doing so, Levere was suggesting that Lincoln should be remembered as essentially a member of all black families. A meeting of African-Americans in South Carolina paid tribute to Lincoln's memory by comparing him to Jesus Christ. For quote, Mr. Lincoln had led them through the Red Sea of blood to freedom and his blood sealed the covenant of the nation with the colored men. And henceforth, when his liberties are threatened, anywhere beneath the starry standard, the blood of Abraham Lincoln will speak. His name is immortal. Shortly after Lincoln's death, Frederick Douglass began to compose a speech called The Assassination and Its Lessons. Lincoln, in Douglass's view, was the first president who rose above the prejudices of his times. Douglass believed Lincoln's views on racial equality had progressed to such an extent that he was president of not only the white man, but also the black man. Douglass speculated that if Lincoln were alive, he would support equal suffrage for African Americans, and his death was therefore an unspeakable calamity to persons of color in particular. Douglas was convinced that, quote, had Mr. Lincoln lived, we might have looked for still greater progress. Learning wisdom by war, he would have learned more from peace. A statewide convention of African American men held at Galesburg, Illinois in the fall of 1866, agreed with this assessment. The convention's address to the American people invoked Lincoln's memory in behalf of the cause of civil rights when it asserted, quote, a voice from the tomb of the martyred Lincoln seems now to reach the national ear, saying the hour is come in which to enfranchise the colored American people. Shortly after Lincoln's assassination, a group of black men in Cincinnati, Ohio, formed a memorial club for the purpose of annually commemorating Lincoln's birthday. These festivities included a banquet, a banquet at one of the members' homes that featured toasts and speeches. At their 1873 commemoration, Thomas Liverpool spoke of his admiration of Lincoln because Lincoln was a white man who in issuing the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves and rejected the idea that Liverpool and his fellow African-Americans were members of an inferior race. According to Liverpool, Lincoln truly believed in the equality of all men. The following year, Liverpool and the Lincoln Memorial Club petitioned Congress to make Lincoln's birthday a national holiday. And the image that I have there on the screen is a copy of the petition that they sent to Congress for that purpose. Reconstruction left both African-Americans and many white Southerners deeply unsatisfied. As the final remaining governments under Republican control in the South fell in 1877, a new contest over the war's meaning and Lincoln's legacy emerged. Proponents of an emancipationist memory of the war enlisted Lincoln on their side. In an 1890 Emancipation Day address in Ohio, A.D. Mail praised the immortal Lincoln for issuing the Emancipation Proclamation and reminded his audience that no heroes had ever fought braver than the black soldiers who marched in the Civil War. While the white Southern journalist Henry Gray went around touting a new South, Mail denounced this as a sham. 
because the South had failed to fulfill its obligation to observe the rights of African Americans. John Mercer Langston's 1891 Memorial Day Address at Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C., was more optimistic than Mail's assessment of the current situation. Langston praised Thomas Ball's sculpture, which Douglas had helped dedicate, as an appropriate way to commemorate the memory of Lincoln, the man who, in Langston's words, gave them their liberty. Langston considered Lincoln the angel of emancipation and asserted that he and the soldiers who gave their lives during the war were responsible for black freedom and citizenship. Langston emphasized the patriotism of African Americans and focused on the fact that they were no longer things or beasts of burden. As the synonym of emancipation itself, Lincoln had made this transformation possible. If Lincoln's legacy represented freedom and the prospect of racial equality to John Mercer Langston, for some white Southerners, Lincoln symbolized a savior of a different sort. According to Jefferson Davis, Alexander Stevens, and others, Lincoln's untimely death was a tragedy because Lincoln would have saved the South from the evils of so-called radical reconstruction. Stevens, the former rebel vice president, claimed the assassination was, quote, the spring from which came afterward unnumbered woes. While one Confederate veteran maintained that Lincoln's death was another Gettysburg to the South. Stevens also claimed that Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation as strictly a war measure and not out of any humanitarian concern for the enslaved. A group of Southern members of Congress led by Hillary Herbert published a volume of essays in 1890, which made it clear that the history of reconstruction demonstrated the folly of federal interference in the domestic affairs of certain states. Herbert, a member of the U.S. House from Alabama, asserted that Lincoln's death was an appalling calamity, especially to the South, for he believed that Lincoln never would have allowed Congress to force what he thought were disastrous policies of racial equality and Black suffrage upon the former Confederate states. In making the case against federal meddling with race relations, the essayists appealed directly to what one of them termed the tender patriot heart of Lincoln in order to make sure the mistakes of Reconstruction were not repeated. Well, what was in Lincoln's heart? Did he possess a black heart that identified with the plight of African Americans and was genuinely committed to racial equality? Or was it a white heart that gave little consideration to black people and placed the interests of white Americans first? Lerone Bennett and the Southern white novelist Thomas Dixon are on common ground when it comes to this question. Just as Bennett's Lincoln was unable to transcend the racism of his era, or abandon his plans for colonization. In The Southerner, A Romance of the Real Lincoln, Dixon's 1913 novel depicted Lincoln as a true friend of the white South, whose main objectives for his second term in office were to quote, heal the bitterness of the war and remove the Negro race from physical contact with the white race. Dixon's Lincoln realized the foolishness of the radical Republican plan for a biracial democracy. And instead, he would have used African-American soldiers to dig the Panama Canal and deport the rest of the black population. Though not as harsh as Bennett, the black abolitionist Peter H. Clark anticipated much of Bennett's argument by over 75 years when he wrote that the Emancipation Proclamation was merely a necessity forced from the unwilling hand of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln, according to Clark, viewed the conflict as a white man's war and considered issues only from the standpoint of the white man's interest. For Lincoln, preservation of the Union was paramount, and he represented a white constituency that was both anti-slavery and anti-Negro. Clark was not alone in thinking Lincoln possessed a white heart as evidenced by the wide variety of opinions on Lincoln that were produced during the centennial year of his birth in 1909. The Cleveland Gazette, a leading black newspaper, editorialized that Lincoln was a great man, 
but he was not the greatest friend of our race by a good deal. Instead, the Gazette asserted that it was the abolitionists, William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and Elijah Lovejoy, who had the heart interest in the anti-slavery movement. The Emancipation Proclamation, according to the Gazette, was a war measure pure and simple that was forced from Lincoln. John M. Gandy, a college professor in Virginia, argued that Lincoln loved the Union more than he did either white or black men. And the Emancipation Proclamation was only the result of military necessity. Gandhi also pointed out that Lincoln favored colonization and denied political and social equality to the Negro on the ground that the great physical differences between the races would never allow it. Nevertheless, Gandhi also noted that Lincoln possessed the courage and deep convictions to claim that Blacks were entitled to natural rights under the Declaration of Independence. And this opened a door of opportunity. African Americans were still waiting for their rights in 1909, and Gandhi was pessimistic that natural rights would be recognized and preserved without political and civil rights. Archibald Grimke, a civil rights activist, emphasized Lincoln's hesitancy and conservatism on the slavery issue. Grimke, like Lerone Bennett, argued that more than any other man of his time, Lincoln was the embodiment of the feelings of his section. For Grimke, Lincoln's attachment to the Constitution and its concessions to slavery amounted almost to idolatry. Lincoln finally took action against slavery after nearly two years of war, and the Emancipation Proclamation was nothing less than what Grimke termed the psychologic moment for the war, for Black people, and the entire nation. On the centennial of Lincoln's birth, Grimke lamented that the actual condition of African Americans was not yet in accordance with the theory of freedom and the Emancipation Proclamation was still awaiting its full implementation. Though Grimke and Gandhi preferred a more ambivalent Lincoln, many African Americans embraced an unambiguous heroic image of Lincoln as a Christ-like great emancipator. Writing in 1909, Booker T. Washington considered Lincoln, quote, the emancipator of my race and claimed that the people Lincoln freed owed him a debt of gratitude. James L. Curtis compared Lincoln to Christ and asserted that he was a true friend of the black man who possessed a heart that was large enough to bring within the range of its sensibilities every human being beneath the stars. For Etta Cotton, a school principal in Alabama, the Emancipation Proclamation redeemed an entire race of people and elevated Lincoln to a Christ-like status. There was a special relationship between Lincoln and the race he freed, for in Cotton's view, only they could truly appreciate the full meaning of the Emancipation Proclamation. Kelly Miller of Howard University likened Lincoln to Christ as well, because he was a man of sorrows who had performed a divine mission. Even though the preservation of the Union was the chief burden of Lincoln's heart, Miller characterized the Emancipation Proclamation as the greatest charter of human liberty ever penned by the hand of man. And its subordinate purpose did nothing to diminish its moral grandeur. For George W. Henderson, a dean at Fisk University, Lincoln was in the same league as Moses, and perhaps even greater since he freed what Henderson termed an alien race. Henderson dismissed the fact that the Emancipation Proclamation was the result of military necessity and instead focused on the process of growth that Lincoln experienced during his career. Lincoln was, in Henderson's view, quote, the first public man of note to suggest Negro citizenship. And he used his skill as a statesman to impress upon the country the profound convictions of his heart. As historian David Blight argues, by the early 20th century, many white Americans ignored the consequences and unfinished work of emancipation in the interest of healing the wounds of the Civil War. Reconciliation between North and South became the order of the day. Southern whites were willing, though perhaps somewhat grudgingly, to recognize Lincoln's greatness in exchange for non-interference in their domestic affairs and an acknowledgement that radical reconstruction had been a tragic error. 
Many whites in the North increasingly accepted this bargain by turning a blind eye to disfranchisement, Jim Crow segregation, and lynching. Lincoln's legacy therefore served as a bridge to sectional reconciliation that minimized the significance of emancipation and the unfinished work of racial equality. While one African-American educator in Florida welcomed that the slave and his former master, the blue and the gray together, were honoring the greatest apostle of freedom, by 1913, many African-Americans rejected this reconciliationist effort to celebrate Lincoln without addressing issues related to the legacy of emancipation. To mark the 50th anniversary of the final Emancipation Proclamation, W.E.B. Du Bois delivered an address at a large commemorative event in Chicago, where he worried that the country was drifting towards oligarchy, because by this time, eight Southern states had effectively disfranchised Black voters. Instead of praising Lincoln as the great emancipator, Du Bois argued that the nation must honor Lincoln's legacy by making democracy effective in America. In a speech before the Massachusetts legislature on Lincoln's birthday, Assistant Attorney General William H. Lewis referred to the Emancipation Proclamation as an unprecedented moral revolution, which redeemed the precious promise of the Declaration of Independence. However, the work of emancipation remained incomplete, and Lewis suggested that the solution to the race problem was simply to follow the example of the great emancipator and remove the disabilities of color from the people Lincoln had liberated. In the wake of a large blue-gray reunion held at Gettysburg in the summer of 1913, the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper lamented that with the exception of slavery, the South had gained everything it fought for during the Civil War. The Afro-American doubted Lincoln ever imagined that his famous phrase, of the people, by the people, for the people, from the Gettysburg Address would be interpreted as applying only to white people. The Cleveland Gazette was appalled by the silly and hypocritical fawning that places on equality the wearers of the blue and the gray. The work of emancipation was being undone by an effort to re-enslave African-Americans. And as long as sectional reconciliation prevailed, the South would be allowed to continue its campaign of anti-Negro warfare. The Gazette therefore deemed a second emancipation necessary. As monuments to the defeated rebellion increasingly dotted the landscape in the South, the Lincoln Memorial in Washington was designed as a symbol of sectional reconciliation. And it was dedicated in 1922 before a racially segregated audience. Virtually ignoring Lincoln's role as great emancipator, the monument instead burnished his image as savior of the Union. And this was despite the efforts of Robert Moton, who at this time was president of the Tuskegee Institute and the lone African-American speaker at the dedication ceremony. In a draft of his remarks, Moton asserted that the task of emancipation remained incomplete and the monument to Lincoln was, quote, but a hollow mockery, a symbol of hypocrisy, unless we together can make real in our national life in every state and in every section, the things for which he died. In the version he delivered at the dedication ceremony, Moton instead stated that Lincoln had not died in vain because the hearts of Americans, both North and South, were devoted to healing the wounds of war and restoring the Union. Moton's revised speech was more in accordance with the reconciliationist message of both the monument and its dedication ceremony, which featured veterans from both sides in the Civil War. For former president and then current Chief Justice William Howard Taft, who served as chair of the Lincoln Memorial Commission, the monument represented, in his words, the restoration of the brotherly love between North and South. You may recognize this. This is the inscription. These words are the inscription on the wall behind Daniel Chester French's statue of Lincoln inside the Lincoln Memorial. And they, I think, 
succinctly exemplify this theme of reconciliation where Lincoln is honored and will be forever remembered as the man who saved the Union. These words were clearly an inspiration to Georgia Douglas Johnson, a leading poet of the Harlem Renaissance. She wrote a tribute poem to Lincoln that was published in the same year as the Lincoln Memorial's dedication. As a resident of Washington, Johnson could view the memorial as it was being constructed. In a few lines that you see here on the screen, Johnson revised the inscription in the Lincoln Memorial so that it included African-Americans whose hearts she believed will always revere the memory of Abraham Lincoln. In response to the Lincoln Memorial's dedication, W.E.B. Du Bois pursued a different course than Johnson when he published a very short piece in The Crisis, the monthly magazine of the NAACP, of which Du Bois was the editor. In this piece, Du Bois described Lincoln as a poor white Southerner who was uneducated, ugly in physical appearance, and awkward, a consummate politician. Yet Du Bois also saw something big inside Lincoln and concluded that Lincoln was, in his words, big enough to be inconsistent. Lincoln both despised black people and favored their citizenship. Lincoln protected slavery and freed slaves. Du Bois offended so many readers of the crisis with this piece that he issued an apology. And in this apology, Du Bois made it clear that he loved Lincoln, but he loved Lincoln precisely because he was a human being and imperfect. Less than a year after the Lincoln Memorial was dedicated, the U.S. Senate approved a loyal slave monument to be erected not far from the memorial, and an anti-lynching bill was successfully filibustered. For M. Cravath Simpson, who was active in the National Association of Colored Women, this was a time when America needed Lincoln the most. The National Association of Colored Women helped lead a successful campaign to block the construction of this proposed Loyal Slave Monument. And in February 1923, Simpson gave an address commemorating Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. In her remarks, Simpson expressed her wish that, quote, such a man as Abraham Lincoln stood today at the head of affairs in Washington. He would make the Congress know that while they had closed their eyes to the Constitution of the United States and will not enforce its laws, that the Declaration of Independence still stands. Simpson was very much concerned about the recent resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan and the failure of Congress to approve the anti-lynching bill. She believed that if leaders in Washington simply enforced Lincoln's own interpretation of the Declaration of Independence, true equality could be achieved. A half century after the Cleveland Gazette urged the necessity of a second emancipation, the Chicago Defender editorialized that the task of emancipation remained unfinished since equality and democracy had not yet been fully achieved. The centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation occurred at a time of increasing frustration over a lack of progress in civil rights. While an effort was made to mark the 100th anniversary of emancipation, some African-Americans concluded that there was little to celebrate. The Baltimore Afro-American observed that the centennial of the proclamation would undoubtedly resurrect the quote, dreary refrain that President Lincoln gave you your freedom, when in fact, thousands of brave black men paid dearly with their blood and with their lives for freedom and owed Lincoln no fawning vote of gratitude for his belated stroke of the pen. Martin Luther King Jr., however, took issue with those who believe the Emancipation Proclamation was not worthy of commemoration. In an address at the New York Emancipation Proclamation Centennial Observance, in September 1962, King emphasized what he called the positive results of Lincoln's proclamation and defended him against charges that the proclamation was a hollowed pronouncement 
from an opportunistic politician. Though Lincoln's heart was tortured by the race question, the Emancipation Proclamation deserved to live in sacred honor. And the best way to commemorate it was to make its declaration of freedom real. King urged President Kennedy to issue a second Emancipation Proclamation that would have prohibited racial discrimination. And his famed address at the Lincoln Memorial in August 1963 began by paying tribute to Lincoln and the centennial anniversary of the first Emancipation Proclamation. Yet the thrust of King's argument was that 100 years later, African Americans were still not completely free. Malcolm X rejected this view that Lincoln was a God who brought us out of slavery and dismissed the Emancipation Proclamation as insignificant. If the original proclamation had been authentic, Malcolm X reasoned that King, quote, wouldn't have to be begging for another proclamation of emancipation today. Julius Lester, in 1968, condemned the notion that Lincoln freed the slaves and that Blacks should be grateful as, quote, one of the bigger lies that America has given the world. According to Lester, Lincoln did not issue the proclamation out of the goodness of his heart. And instead of praising him, Black people should be angry with him for waiting so long to take action against slavery. Lerone Bennett's essay in Ebony was therefore just one of several disillusioned and angry voices from the 1960s. The Chicago Defender noted that Black people had been deceived for a long time about Lincoln, and Bennett's piece enabled a true image of Lincoln to emerge. Yet there was nothing especially new in Bennett's argument. Others had articulated many of Bennett's criticisms several years prior, but Bennett's provocative choice of words and his timing struck a chord with those who were fed up with a lack of progress since 1863. Lincoln proved a convenient target for this frustration. But Bennett should not be seen as the lone representative voice from the 1960s. The decade also witnessed the publication of distinguished monographs on Lincoln by John Hope Franklin and Benjamin Quarles, both prominent, well-respected African-American scholars who offered more measured and nuanced assessments. Franklin acknowledged the Emancipation Proclamation as what he called the great American document of freedom, even though its promise had not yet been fully met. The differences between Franklin and Bennett are simply another example of a trend that the Baltimore Afro-American identified in 1922. Following the controversial dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, the Afro-American observed that, quote, there has and always will be a difference of opinion among African Americans on Abraham Lincoln. No consensus is likely anytime soon regarding what was in Lincoln's heart concerning his true feelings on racial equality. And though African Americans knew Lincoln by heart, these hearts have always been divided. My last slide is a photograph that I took actually the last time I flew on an airplane. I presented a paper at a conference in Boston, and it just so happened that my hotel was right next to a copy of Thomas Ball's Emancipation Group statue. And not long after I took this photograph, um, had a lot of controversies in this country about monuments, and last year this, this monument was removed. So that's my presentation. I uh, appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to, to field any questions that you might have. And let's see, I'll stop sharing. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, yeah. Barb and I are, are back with you. I really appreciate the presentation um, covering uh, quite a bit of history and many perspectives throughout history, many African-American perspectives throughout history. Um, and as Matthew said, He's willing to take some questions. So if you have a question, um, uh, feel free to put that in the comment section down below. Would love to address some questions uh, tonight. Barb, do you have a question? I, I, have, I have a few questions. I have a few questions myself. <laughs> Why don't you start, Pat? <laughs> um, I'm always interested in um, uh, historians' motivation. Um, so, Matthew, could you 
Could you talk about uh, what what motivated you to write this uh, book and uh, study this topic? Um, and 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 you know, um, yeah, if you just want to explain your your motivation for this book. Okay, well, it, I guess it goes back to when I was an undergraduate at Knox College, and I studied with a couple of professors there, Rodney Davis and Douglas Wilson, who were just then embarking on a major project to edit the writings and interviews that Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon, collected. And I took a really great course from them my first year of college on Abraham Lincoln. And I guess I did well enough for them to ask me to be their research assistant. So I did that my last three years. And Wow, I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I became interested in Lincoln, but then I went to graduate school at the University of Illinois and I studied with the, the late, great Robert Johansson yeah. who wrote a uh, thousand page biography of Lincoln's nemesis, Stephen A. Douglas. Mm -hmm. And Johansson had little use for Lincoln. Yeah. And so I got two very uh, <laughs> divergent perspectives. And then when I was working on my dissertation, uh, I had the opportunity to go back to Knox and work on this project to help make the Lincoln papers at the Library of Congress available online. And one of my duties was to go through the entire collection of over 20,000 documents. Wow. And having done that, uh, I thought, wow, there's just a whole bunch of projects one could do. And when I was living in Galesburg, I became interested in the history of Knox College, the anti-slavery and abolition movement that was very prominent in the founding of the college. And I, I wrote an article on race relations in Galesburg that came to the attention of another former professor of mine at Knox, Fred Horde. And he called me up and he said, well, we should do a project together. And I then went on to Gettysburg College, and, and as my time there ended, I, I met with, with Fred, and we were talking about potential projects, and we landed on this idea, which no one has done, and that is to try and collect a comprehensive edition of African American speeches and writings on Lincoln. And when we got into it, we had no idea what we were getting into, and it, it, it's taken us over a decade. To, to put all of this together, but it will finally be out next year. And we're really looking forward to seeing it in print finally after all these years. So I never really uh, planned on becoming a Lincoln scholar, but that's the way a lot of careers go. You never know what path and what opportunities will emerge. Certainly. And it probably didn't help hurt that, uh, that Knox College is the site of one of the um, Lincoln Douglas debates, right? right. Which, which is why there are Lincoln scholars there. Right? Yes, yes. When I, I was talking to students today about Lincoln in class, and I mentioned the the debates, and I said, "Well, you know, I went to Knox, and that was one of the sites, and that helped sell me on going there." I thought that was a really neat connection that the the main building there was the last standing structure from the seven debates between. Did you Did you do a college tour? Of course. Because I, two of my children did a college tour there, and and they insist on showing you the chair it's that, there. Right. Right. that That's right. supposedly yes somebody sat in Lincoln, Lincoln. said you know, and, <laughs> and then they let you sit in it you know <laughs> as a museum person I'm going no <laughs> first off how how did you authenticate this secondly i'm not sitting in a 150 year old chair i don't care right because it, if you can't authenticate it then i certainly don't want to want to add to its destruction but <laughs> right. no they but showed me the fun. chair i mean that's i think that's been part of the college tour since probably 1859. <laughs> <laughs> sure. well there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in galesburg um mm -hmm. for sure um, which brings me to my questions, because as a as as a as a child of Cincinnati, hmm. um, I was kind of interested in a couple things there. First off, was Liverpool's resolution um, successful? Is that when uh, Lincoln's um, birthday became a holiday? Or no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't successful. And and I mentioned John Mercer Langston. He was also in Congress briefly, and, and he introduced a bill to make Lincoln's birthday a holiday, and that didn't pass. And then we went through a period from 1901 to the, to the 1920s where there were no African-Americans in Congress. 
Right. And then Oscar DePriest was elected from Chicago. And one of the bills he introduced during his time in Congress was a bill to make Lincoln's birthday a holiday, a national holiday, and that didn't pass either. So, mm -hmm. so today we have the, the, the generic uh, President's Day in February. Well, and so in Ohio and I'm growing up and here in Illinois when my kids are growing up, um, well, I guess probably not then, but um, earlier, it was a state holiday. Mm -hmm. And so I always assumed that President's Day was the averaging of Lincoln's and Washington's birthday because because it's right in the middle, usually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Washington's birthday was, and then they, I don't know what year it was, that they kind of made this sort of generic president. Yeah, well, they did all of them at once, right? Yeah, I think so. I think it was sometime in the, I don't know, was it the 60s? 70s, I think it was in the okay, 70s. So, okay. Yeah. Um, so a couple, a couple of other questions. Archibald Grimke, is he related to the Grimke, Grimke sisters? Yes. Okay. Yes, he was. Because they were they were ardent abolitionists, but also suffragists, right? They they were, yeah. They, and so he was related to them. Okay. Yeah. And did they have a Cincinnati connection or not? The Grimke sisters? Not that uh, not, I'm feeling like maybe well, they maybe they knew the Beechers. They well, yes. And then uh um, Okay. One of them married Theodore Dwight Weld, who did spend time in Cincinnati. Okay. At the Lane Seminary. Yeah. So Lane Seminary connection. That's what I was yes. remembering. And of course, yeah. Lane Seminary, we actually had um um what's her name? Uh, uh Christina Hartley speak last year. She she was from the um Henry Ward Beecher oh, the, home. The, the Stowe House. The Stowe House, the Stowe House, right? Yeah. Good. Um, and then the third question, I found it also fascinating that William Howard Taft, another Cincinnatian, mm -hmm. <laughs> is the guy who is, well, you quoted him as as being the one of the big reconciling voices, right? Yes. Um, and I can see how that comes out of, out of, Cincinnati because of it where of its location it um it's right there at the border mm -hmm. and it's the first uh it's the first free territory really right um and of course there's a whole underground notable uh, uh underground railroad mm -hmm. connection there too Mm -hmm. um, do you do you think that informs maybe both Liverpool and and uh, and Taft's thinking at all? Uh, it 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 might have. I'm not sure. I think I think that this this reconciliation that I talk about um, and that David Blight has written a lot about uh, this was really a, a national phenomenon. And it was, it was something that um, on one level had to happen at the end of the Civil War. I mean, Lincoln wanted right. to keep the Union together and we had to reunite. But uh, as I was suggesting, and certainly Blight has written an entire book on this, um, it really went too far mm. in, in the sense that it, it became more about placating white Southerners than what you might call a genuine reconciliation. Yeah. And uh, what I find interesting and what I've done a lot of research on, and I talked a little bit about it, was the, the extent to which white Southerners were were also then kind of claiming Lincoln. That's uh, bizarre to me. <laughs> it is strange. But what they did is they seized upon some of the things that Lincoln said in the 1850s about race and acted like he he didn't evolve or he didn't he didn't change his view on some of these issues right. that the Lincoln of the debates in 1858 was the same Lincoln in 1865 and therefore if he had lived to finish his second term there's no way he would have supported what they called radical reconstruction the enfranchisement of african american men and a a more punitive reconstruction policy against the defeated rebels 
So I think I really believe that Lincoln then becomes kind of this bridge to reconciliation and you and you see it in the Lincoln Memorial. It was specifically designed as a symbol of national unity. Right. Um, we have a long comment. Pat, okay. you want to speak to that? Yeah. Um, uh, so Brian is asking, uh, and I'm not quite sure his entire comment or question is fitting on the page. So Brian, if you're still there, it looks like you're just starting to ask the question at the end. If you could chime back in, that would be great. But he says it is notable that these arguments among different camps of African-Americans and emerging from roughly speaking Northern whites and Southern whites manifest themselves as contesting representations of Lincoln and his legacy. It seems that none of them declines to regard Lincoln as significant. That is to say, whether they adore or revel Lincoln, he is the fulcrum on which they all leverage their arguments. So shifting the physics of the metaphor somewhat, why are these contesting parties? Thank you, Brian. Why are these contesting parties unable to escape the gravity of Lincoln as that center which their arguments orbit. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Matthew? Well, there I would throw in with Lerone Bennett. He wrote a book that came out in the year 2000 called Forced into Glory, which was a, an extension of his 1968 essay. But in that book, I think it's in the introduction, Bennett says, look, no matter what we think of Lincoln, he is of such transcendent significance that we have to weigh in on him. That yeah. whether we like him or we don't like him, he he's so central to American identity. So I that I guess that's what I would say is that you just you can't escape him. He 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 just looms so large on the landscape of our of our memories that one way or another you have you have to account for it. You have to take him into account, whether you like him or you don't like him, or whether you have a more nuanced view of him. He's he's always there. He's the, he's this looming presence. I don't Thanks know for that. that. Okay. Um, uh, you know, as as working in a museum, I'm always curious about the uh, the search for the sources. I know you mentioned you know your work um, with uh, the Lincoln Papers and putting those online and then your work at Knox College. But mm -hmm. are there any particular uh, sources uh, of note that really struck you when when doing this research or one that that you just found really profound and in, in the book or any repositories or archives that you just really enjoyed, you know, searching through for for this book or anything else about the sources you want to talk about? Well, I think what what this really facilitated much of the research on this book is technology and the fact that so many newspapers and books and pamphlets have been digitized and are available now online. So there are a lot of newspaper databases that I mine, some of them specifically devoted to African-American newspapers. I also, uh, I don't know how many prescriptions for my glasses I've gone through since this project started, because I also read a lot <laughs> And there's there's still a lot of stuff that hasn't been digitized and but it is available on microfilm and i don't know if any of you've looked at microfilm before but that that really puts a lot of strain on your eyes so i've yeah. i've read a lot of microfilm but really i think what what's been revolutionary in the study of history and i think other fields is just the availability now of of primary source material at online whether it's through subscription databases you can get through your your library or just institutions on their own scanning things and, and making them available. And of course, even when things aren't digitized, uh, librarians everywhere have been very helpful in fielding my queries and providing me with scans or photocopies. So it's it's been a long process, but, but a lot of it's been made uh, a little bit easier because of just everything that's available online now. Yeah, yeah, the accessibility of sources has just, you know, even within, you know, I've even noticed um, in the time of the pandemic when, you know, maybe a lot of other projects uh, or a lot of projects prior to the pandemic would have been put on the back burner. I just saw just this this wave of, of, of sources being digitized and put online um, mm -hmm. and the accessibility of sources just greatly increasing. And I think, you know, this information 
revolution uh you know that we're in it just the ex increasing the accessibility is going to be so great for studying yeah. history or, or, or a number of other humanities or you know at, at, at anything you know it's going to be it's going to mm -hmm. be great mm -hmm. so yeah i really really agree with that um any other questions out there um feel free to ask those uh barb do you have any any other questions any other burning thoughts out no, there no I, I was looking at my uh, my uh <clears throat> Questions. Oh, you know, I, I actually really, I'm kind of going along with what Brian said. Um, I was fascinated by, by, uh, W.B. Du Bois, um, mm -hmm. view of Lincoln, because I, I actually think that's like the most accurate one, right? <laughs> that, that, that as you said he is the he is the he is so significant and, and just like every human being he's flawed right so mm -hmm. oh, you can admire somebody and see their flaws at the same time right and and that that is the approach to history that we should we should strive for always right <laughs> Um, so really, I, I had never heard that before, and I, I really, really appreciated you bringing that forward. Thank you. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah. That that piece appeared in The Crisis, I think, in July 1922, and it upset so many readers. Du Bois got so much angry mail that he had to issue this. This He says he's sorry that he upset people, but then he says, but I the reason why I love Lincoln is because he's a human being and he's imperfect, so... Yeah. Yeah. We need to keep that in the top of our mind these days, I think. <laughs> <Don't be perfect. laughs> about everything about all aspects of history, not just Lincoln. Right. <laughs> well, um, appears to be the end of the questions. Um and uh Matthew, I just wanted to again say, you know, on behalf of Museum of the Grand Prairie and you know, all our viewers out there, myself included and uh, you know, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Barb, you got any, uh, any final words? Yeah, no, I, I just, I just loved it. I thought it was great. I um, really appreciate you, 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 you spending an hour with us or a couple hours with us tonight and, and, and soldiering through the technical problems. And I want to thank our audience for soldiering through the technical <laughs> problems and us talking a little bit extra at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> well. yeah. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and I have every intention of us having a 15th annual uh, Lincoln Lecture Series next year. And as I said at the beginning, uh, hopefully it will be a hybrid so people can um, can uh, join us whether they're stuck at home um I hope god i hope we're not still worried uh, as worried about the pandemic but that may be true too okay. and or what and you know you can come in if if you can so um we'll uh hopefully we'll see you next year and that's some of our other great events coming up and brian throwkeld had a final yeah, Brian said intriguing intellectual project. Thanks to all. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for thanks, thanks for tuning in. Um, Matthew, any any final words? Also, you said the book comes out next year. Any any next more year. any more details past next year you want to reveal? Uh, early next year or is still uh, kind of in the works? Well, uh, right now they're saying like fall. Fall. Fall of next year. Fall of next year. Yeah. So if you, it, yeah. These books take a while to make their way through the pipeline of the university oh, sure. press system. Sure. It's in the works, so a year from now we should be able to actually hold hold it in our hands. Finally. Well, congratulations yeah. in advance. That's, yeah. a, that's a huge accomplishment. So yeah, great. congratulations on you know such a great project, and you know it's uh, uh, I have to get my hands on it next fall. Um, so if you're out there watching, get your hands on it um, as well. Be on the lookout for it. Um, again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, Thank you, Dad. yeah, um, I am going to end the broadcast and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into CUI's TV. We hope you enjoyed the show. This video can be accessed anytime on youtube.com. 
in the YouTube search bar, type in UPTV6 and look for their microphone logo. We hope you will join us again next week for more local, engaging content designed specifically for Champaign County older adults. Take care and stay safe.